Good morning, everybody. Um, if you look on page 24 of your sons, which I hope you're all uh, clutching uh, dutifully in front of you, the newspaper, I mean, not your uh, biological children, uh, you'll notice that there's a, a small advertisement urging anybody who's seen an unidentified flying object to phone 638151, the talkback number, between 9 and 10 this morning. The reason is that we have, uh, as our guest this morning, uh, Professor James E. MacDonald, who's the senior physicist in the Institute of Atmospheric Physics and professor in the Department of Meteorology at the University of Arizona, uh, of, sorry, of Arizona at uh, Tucson. Um, professor MacDonald, uh, how long have you been in Australia now? Uh, since the twenty uh, fourth, about almost two weeks now. Now uh, the the r report here says slightly misleadingly. I think I may have accidentally misled them when I made some reference to it last week. That you were here as a uh, heading a team of researchers sponsored by the U.S. government. Now, what oh, is the status of your? No, my, my work is essentially an individual study of the problem. Been on it for a little over a year now. Tell us something about the University of, of Arizona. Um, Australians have only perhaps in the last generation become extremely conscious of, of universities and their their enormous role. How big is your university? Mm, 20,000 students. So in other words, it's bigger than, bigger than any Australian university. Is that right, yes. Mm -hmm. Although Arizona's a, a good deal smaller in terms mm, of population one, one and than, million, yes. than Victoria. Um, tell us something about the record of the University of Arizona so far as it relates to uh, astronomy and uh, the study of meteorology. What's the particular qualification of the University of Arizona in this field? Well, I suppose our uh, crystal clear skies, uh, much like uh, Central Australia, bring uh, lots of astronomers to uh, this area uh, of Tucson. We have uh, the Kitt Peak National Observatory and uh, several different uh, groups of uh, uh, astronomical uh, research investigators. The uh, dryness of the climate, I guess, is what brings my group there. Uh, we're concerned with cloud physics and uh, weather modification, rainmaking and the sort. So uh, it's a good place to uh, do things in the atmosphere and in the skies. And of course, Professor Bart Bock, who was at Mount Stromlo in Canberra, is now at Arizona. That's right. He's heads the Department of Astronomy at the University of Arizona now. And, and Clyde Tombaugh, who my recollection is correct, first sighted Pluto, I think, is also... Well, no, he's the next state over. He's in New Mexico. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. New, New yes. Mexico. Well, I, right. I, I, I've I withdrawn. Apologize. All right. Now, um, tell us something about your, your interest in... Uh, the misnamed flying saucers or the identi uh, unidentified flying objects. How long have you been uh, um, pursuing this? Well, uh, nearly full time for a year, and uh, I've had a casual interest in the problem for uh, about uh, 10 or 12 years, but uh, really got going about a year ago uh, in checking cases in the U.S., looking into the nature and quality of the official investigatory program, talking with colleagues in uh, various scientific uh, areas uh, for about a month, uh, about uh, 12 months now. You've, you've described uh, unidentified flying objects as the greatest scientific problem of our times. Are, are you really serious? Indeed. Serious about the extent that of, of, of it's uh, that it is the greatest, surely. Yes. Though. No, I'm, I'm serious about that. Greater than controlling population, or greater than? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, tell us why. It appears that for at least 20 years, the the uh, Earth has been uh, visited, shall we say, or under uh, something resembling reconnaissance by objects of a completely. Uh, uh, unfamiliar technological uh, types, uh, craft of some sort that are not uh, products of our technology. The uh, evidence for the reality of this phenomenon, the strong suggestion that it's something in the direction of, we could say, surveillance, is, uh, is extremely strong, so much stronger than any uh, evidence that's out on the top of the table that uh, citizens of either America or Australia or any other, other country are aware of. Uh, the evidence is so strong that it's uh, really uh, nothing short of astonishing. The implications for uh, impact on world affairs and uh, man's thinking in general seems to me to be tremendous in this uh, problem that is so widely regarded as just a nonsense problem. A very well, serious situation. Ex except that there's one reservation that has to be made, and that is that it's very rare that you find um, such a bulk, such an enormous volume of of uh, manifestations or of phenomena or, or, or observed phenomena in any case, which are perhaps capable of being explained, explained away or, or analyzed on the basis of saying that it's due to uh, uh, faulty observation or psychological uh, uh, aberrations and so on. Isn't, isn't that the, the problem that... Uh, uh, well, that's the way, uh, that's the official position that's taken, uh, certainly in the U.S. and apparently here. In fact, uh, that 
uh, point of view comes only uh, from persons who have not really carefully examined the problem. In the States, it's, uh, uh, I think most Americans uh, uh, are under the serious misimpression that the American Air Force has studied the problem. Yes. They make statements like that, that uh, these sightings are by made by incompetent people or people who don't know when they're looking at Venus and fireballs and the like. In fact, when you go out, as I'm doing here with the aid of the Melbourne uh, Investigatory Group and others, the, uh, the facts are diametrically opposite of that. Uh, what you really find is that uh, very reliable people, of course there are, mind you, there are plenty of, of uh, misinterpreted phenomena, yep. but, the, but the important point is that in, in this uh, is a very large volume of extremely significant reports of utterly unconventional objects look, uh, in, in for, to all intents and purposes, to be machines, not uh, blobs of light and so on. And this, this evidence is very, very large. All right, now I've got news for you. We're going away for just a moment or two, and when we return, I want to talk to you about the official attitude, not only of the United States government, but of other governments too, and I want to talk to you about what evidence you've examined in Australia, mm. what conclusions you've reached about Australian sightings, and then, of course, uh, or perhaps even uh, in between, we want to hear what the listeners have to say. Not just vague uh, feelings about lights in the sky, but if there are any specific details that we can pinpoint, we may help to make scientific history this morning. It's Talkback, 3DB 638151, Professor James MacDonald, Professor of Meteorology at the University of Arizona on Unidentified Flying Object. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Yes. Uh, uh, my name is Hurton. I uh, would like to speak to uh, Professor um, MacDonald uh, regarding the flying objects. Uh, apparently, uh, uh, I, don't know, I don't know much about it myself as such, of course, as uh, uh, lots of us don't, of course, as days, but uh, uh, what I would like to be interested in is perhaps uh, uh, I'm, I've been always interested in a, in a scientific attitude towards life as such, and uh, personally, I can't bring myself to believe in this uh, flying object as being something uh, uh, coming from uh, uh, interplanetary travel or something of that nature from the knowledge we seem to have today. It doesn't seem that we, uh, we expect life as we know it, or if it, if it, is, as, as, if it is not as we know it, if life uh, can be more intelligent than ours, in a uh, higher order of intelligence, and uh, uh, as far as interstellar travel, it seems to be rather far-fetched at this stage. Well, uh, uh, I, I just try to find out whether there is a basically a scientific explanation for all those things. As far as I heard, um, apparently uh, they have been able in America to um, uh, more or less explain scientifically by, uh, through known scientific data all the uh, unexplained uh, phenomena so far. And I understand that there is a new uh, concept of plasmoid, uh, if I'm right, and I just can't, can't quite understand it, but apparently they can through that plasmoid explain a lot of unknown and unexplained phenomena so far. Now, can Professor McDonald explain to me what this plasmoid is all about? All right, and so in other words, what you want, just to recapitulate for the listeners, what you want is to uh, see what Professor McDonald thinks of the um, explanations that have been given, explanations perhaps in inverted commas, which um, have the effect of explaining away all these recorded phenomena. Yes, go on, Professor. Well, yes, I've, of course, been studying that very carefully, including the one that uh, you have asked about. The plasma explanation is largely due to uh, one uh, uh, writer, Aviation Week and Technology, a fellow named Philip Klass. I've had discussions with him and others about that. But the difficulty is, with that explanation, the plasma and corona discharge explanation, as in many others uh, that uh, tie in meteorological phenomena and astronomical phenomena, that they are made by persons who are not at all aware of the actual uh, facts and details of the observations. If one were only talking about glowing, hazy, luminous blobs of light, then plasmas, which are essentially that, uh, would have to come in for very, very serious consideration. Uh, plasmas or plasmoids are a meteorological phenomenon. Well, they're, they're, it's, it's much more fundamental uh, than that uh, when uh, when a, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in every uh, uh, television set there's a certain amount of uh, plasma in th inside the tubes. Uh, plasma is any ionized cloud of, uh, uh, of uh, material that is uh, nearly fully ionized and it uh, glows and so on. Uh, ball lightning, I think you call them fireballs down here, are a yeah. natural plasma. Uh, and uh, uh, very rarely uh, fireballs and ball lightning uh, are uh, misconstrued and reported as UFOs. But really not, uh, I think only one or so percent of all the sightings in the Air Force files are that. The main point is that we're talking in the UFO problem primarily not about luminous phenomena of that sort, uh, but about uh, persons uh, who are seeing hard metallic objects at close range, some of them 10 and 20 feet, craft-like objects frequently hovering, uh, making no sound, sometimes darting off at extremely high speeds, and not hazy, plasmoid-type uh, phenomena. But isn't it true that plasma as such can be, can be actually traced by radar? 
Uh, the same as a metallic object? Oh, yes. Uh, when when a, a ballistic uh, missile or a, a satellite uh, uh, is re-entering the atmosphere, it, uh, or a meteor, uh, it, is, uh, it creates uh, a plasma that uh, does indeed give uh, a pretty good radar echo. Yes, there's no problem in that score. Uh, and uh, if you had only observations of that kind, but there are, uh, you might say, well, maybe we have some new type of plasma. And indeed, uh, that hypothesis uh, is one that uh, uh, has to be given very serious consideration in, in, a, in a very small number of the cases. But uh, the, we're talking about daytime observations. Uh, interviewed a fellow just uh, out in the Dandenongs uh, yesterday, for example, uh, who was uh, working in an orchard uh, when he and uh, uh, a couple of others uh, saw an object to move across behind the steel range. This was a, a long, silvery, metallic object, no wings, no uh, exhaust propeller, no noise, anything like that. Very, very far from anything remotely resembling a plasmoid. I see. All right, anyway, thanks very much for calling. Thank you. Thank you. Talk back 638151, Professor James E. MacDonald on Unidentified Flying Objects. I may say, by the way, that uh, uh, we are about to pass through, if we haven't already passed through, the 20th anniversary, exactly, of the, the coining of the phrase flying saucers, because back in June of 1947, uh, uh, a man called Kenneth Arnold, that we might ask Professor MacDonald about later, uh, had a, a very important sighting, or what he claimed to be an important sighting. Uh, press, uh, the, the, the press took the matter up. There was a good deal of interest in it. And it's uh, about the 4th or 5th of July, 1947, that the term flying saucer was first used. And you were saying at that time about the record number of sightings. Yes, on the 6th and 7th, there were uh, about 150 reports in the U.S. on each day. A very large wave, very in unexplainable, uh, rose and uh, fell in uh, in early July, 47. Right? Were, were you a skeptic on flying saucers at that stage? Oh, indeed I was, of course, and for a long time after, yes. When did you cease to be a skeptic? Uh, about a year ago, when I looked at the Air Force files and saw how incompetently and how superficially the whole thing had been investigated. All right, let's have the next call. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Uh, it's Mrs. Smith from South Caulfield. Mm -hmm. um, I'm ringing in reference, of course, to the flying saucers. Yes. Uh, I saw uh, a, a cigar-shaped object, approximately 1949, this would be. Mm -hmm. And um, I think thousands of others saw it too, actually. Uh, it was about 9 to 9.30 p.m. in the evening. Yes. And it was perfectly stationary had a dull light inside and then as though it had electric light globe going up and down from you know top to bottom continuously and uh, i watched it for some time and i got one of my daughters out of bed to verify that it was there in case people thought i'd you know where was this over melbourne yes in hawthorne we were living in hawthorne at the time yes and that's a dry uh, area too hmm? it's a dry area too <laughs> yes anyhow um D did any other neighbours see it? No, unfortunately. I was calling out to one neighbour and she couldn't hear me and I was afraid to leave it in case it vanished. I was just rooted to the spot. Yeah. And uh, I got it at my eye on the level with a quarter of a sleep out just to see if it was moving at all. And it wasn't. It was perfectly still. Uh, what uh, was the state of the weather at the time? Do you Clear. Recall? It was clear and uh, almost cloudless. But um, I, gone in, I went in then to ring the sun. I stayed there for about five minutes and I went in to ring the sun and the chappy on the That was very loyal of you to think of the sun first. Oh, I always do. Ah, well. <laughs> oh, I've been getting the sun for over 30 years. <laughs> no, um, I rang the sun and the chap on the switchboard said that he had also seen it and uh, he was inundated with calls. But I noticed there was nothing much in the paper the next morning about it. Mm. Just a tiny little paragraph. Yeah. Well, uh, the... Um, my daughter saw it. I got one of my daughters out of bed to see it. Yes, might uh, uh, tie your remarks in to uh, the previous question. Uh, that that uh, type of situation, clear sky, there were no thunderstorms anywhere in the area. No, right? not at all. But uh, the mm -hmm. funny thing was, when I came out from the phone, I suppose it would be a period of ten minutes, there was a big black cloud there. A black and cloud. Went, and I waited till the cloud went by and the object had gone. This was 9 p.m.? You were able to see a black cloud in the darkness? In some yes, way? it was more or less like a... Um, uh, I think it would be partly moonlight from what I can remember. It mm. was quite bright and I've... I've always got a habit of looking up at the sky every time I go out. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested. I used to think, well, everybody's seen these except me. Well, uh, of course, it takes much more investigation than we could do on the, on the phone, on the system here, but let me just uh, remark, in terms of what you've said, and uh, just, just to bring up some points there, uh, you're, you're talking about a clear sky, a non-thundery situation. No, uh, not thundery at all. Yes, that rules out... Uh, Quite still. ...plasmoids of the ball lightning type. You're talking about a stationary object together. Yes, and it was low down, about mm. the height that a plane would fly when it's flying 
flying fairly low. Mm, well, we'd have to talk more about that, but uh, let's just take the stationary aspect. Uh, the possibility that it's a meteoric fireball is ruled out by oh, the stationary. Oh, no. <laughs> no, this uh, is a man-made object. Mm, no doubt uh, about it. Yes. Well, that's interesting. Uh, it, can't, it takes about an hour, of course, to uh, do justice to um, any good sighting, and I can't uh, query you on all the important points, but uh, that serves to illustrate the type of situation uh, uh, that rules out uh, quite a number of things. Uh, if the sound is not... Well, there was no sound together. No, not at all. Mm. Well, uh, the, the, this, this is the sort of situation. Soundless objects hovering stationary in, in conditions that do not imply uh, ball lightning oh, uh, no. rule out uh, meteors. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting case, the type of case that uh, if we had an opportunity I'd want to pursue further. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, commenting on that. Uh, who may I be speaking to? That's Professor MacDonald. Oh, very nice. Very nice to meet you too, Mr. Jones. Oh, th well, thanks very much. Yes. All right, talk back 638151. Professor James MacDonald, the University of Arizona, talking about unidentified flying objects. Let's hear from you on 638151. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning, Barry Jones. Yes. I'd like to tell uh, Professor MacDonald mm -hmm. that last, um, uh, late, just before Christmas last year in December... Sp would you speak up just a little? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes. Well, just before Christmas last December, I saw, uh, it was a clear night, I saw what I thought at first was a shooting star, but instead of sort of going uh, down, it went straight across the sky in a, a straight line. Yes. Anyway, um, when it got about, oh, oh, I couldn't tell you how far it had gone, but it stopped for a little while, for oh, a few minutes, and then it sort of went, uh, started moving towards the horizon again after that. And also, in February, now my husband was with me at that, uh, in December, in February, I saw, uh, with my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, we saw two of them. And uh, the first one sort of stopped. It sort of, not stopped, it sort of was, seemed to be hovering. And uh, then we saw another one, and that came up uh, towards the first one, and they appeared to be having some sort of rendezvous. And uh, then the second one moved off into the horizon, and the first one just stayed there stationary. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. This that I might remark that this general category of uh, observation in which it is uh, simply a light in the sky is an extremely dangerous category with respect to misinterpretation. But uh, uh, taking what you described for the moment as a, a very accurate description, uh, since we can't, uh, uh, again, probe and question very carefully here, uh, I would make the following remark that uh, lots of persons in the U.S. and Australia and elsewhere uh, are making reports just like that of lights that uh, move across, hover, exhibit uh, maneuvers that uh, do not at all match meteors, the, the stopping that you described is not at all uncommon. Uh, the fact that another one came up uh, is scarcely uh, meteoric behavior, uh, yeah. and uh, I don't know of any hover, me, hovering meteors uh, in all history of mankind. Nevertheless, that type of, uh, of sighting has to be watched very carefully. Helicopters, aircraft, uh, uh, of course, uh, you have to have a helicopter if you're going to have it uh, uh, hover, uh, can, can mislead us uh, at uh, night. So um, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, caution remark has to be made. Nevertheless, uh, I think uh, that's a, a moderately interesting remark. And, uh, uh, My father-in-law came out and he said he thought it was just a plane, but planes usually have uh, flashing colored lights on them, don't they, at uh, night? Typically, yes, but uh, well, still... There are planes, uh, reconnaissance planes and photo planes with uh, odd and unusual lights, and uh, uh, this this category of report is is not the one on which the strong conclusions uh, need, need now to be uh, built. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, it, it appears that you've uh, seen something of a, of a uh, rather unconventional nature in, in that instance. All right. Anyway, thanks very much for calling. Thank you. Bye. Right, thank you. Talk back, 638151. Good morning. Hello. Yes. Oh, uh, who am I speaking to? Uh, Barry Jones, but oh. Professor James MacDonald is here. Oh, good. Um, yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm, uh, it's in, this, uh, in regard to this um, flying saucer. I thought it might, yes. Yeah, uh, I was um, uh, driving a cab about five years ago. Yes. And uh, I had a passenger going into, into the city. Yes. Uh, this was down in... Um, oh, that bit that runs uh, parallel with Victoria Street there, come the short cut up to East Melbourne. Yes, I, I don't think Professor MacDonald's very familiar with it. I'll get my road map out, though. Yes, go on. And um, I, I was driving in with this fare uh, in a westerly direction, that the going towards the city. Mm -hmm. uh, it was around about 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I saw this object, 
Oh, it would appear to be uh, up over the, um, around about the Eastern Hill, you know? Yes. Uh, like up around about the top of the street. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, 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 def- a definite object there hovering in the sky, uh, cylindrical in, in, um, in shape, and uh, silvery colour. Now, to me, this, uh, this did appear to be uh, an object of some description. I, I, I thought so much about it, I, I brought it to the attention of the fair, mm-hmm. and uh, she saw it also, and uh, I thought that much of it, I went into the Herald office to report it, and uh, I was not the uh, Herald office, thought I was a blooming nut, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, th- there definitely was some object there, uh, awesome. and it disappeared all of a sudden. But this was one of those things that I'd say, just, um, you know. Yes. Uh, oh, it, it, it's something that uh, would take a little bit of explanation. I know there was uh, sun shining brightly and it was a clear sky, but it was there was definitely an object there in the sky. Uh, you uh, saw no wings of any sort on the object? No, no, it was a cylindrical object. I see, and uh, when you say hovering, do you mean it was actually uh, stationary, as nearly as you could tell? St- stationary, yes, mm-hmm. it was stationary, and then all of a sudden it just took off and uh, just flashed off, and, you, uh, and that was the end of it. You didn't see any more of it. I see. I, I, I think if you could give Peter Sarri your number before we, we switch you off, it, it would be a help. We might yes. be able to uh, uh, to check up uh, later and, and talk to you further, or rather get to the... Uh, the uh, Flying Saucers Association to, to follow it up. Because I suppose, if, if I might just butt in here for a minute before you answer, uh, Professor MacDonald, and you can handle both things at once, I think the thing that puzzles me about a story like this is not the fact that the, the gentleman and his fair saw um, something like this, but the fact that, uh, you know, X number of thousands of people didn't see it. You see, if it's around 9 o'clock in the morning, there'd be a lot of people either going to work or wishing they weren't going to work mm-hmm. and gazing up at the sky to look away from the problems of the world. And apparently uh, only a handful of people well two people that we know of but no more than two could see it now well no more than two reported it in any way well yeah, it, 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 point? It, it could have been possible there could have been others seen it but um I, I just happened to be driving into town and, and it was as clear as the, the nose on your face actually the uh, this object in the sky up over eastern hill Mm. Well, uh, yes, the, the, now Very you, clear. you indicate, uh, just to get back to Barry's point, which is an important point, and it, it bears on your your case, evidently, uh, again and again, in interviewing uh, witnesses, uh, uh, I, I, who you hear about these cases, sometimes quite uh, in a quite roundabout fashion, and then you ask the observer, uh, well, were there any other witnesses? And a very common uh, uh, puzzlement arises then. The, the person says, well, no, that uh, was one of the things that really bothered him. He would have thought that dozens of people must have seen it. And then you say, well, where did you report uh, this? Did you report to the Air Force? Uh, did you report it to uh, police or so on? And very commonly, the answer is either, no, I, I didn't report it, uh, fear of ridicule or a little little reluctance to uh, have it sensationalized or so on uh, is involved, or uh, the kind of thing that you just mentioned is not at all uncommon in the States, and evidently here, too. Uh, one reports it to someone and uh, uh, press uh, or official uh, channels, and a certain amount of uh, skepticism uh, leads to a uh, uh, ridiculous uh, rebuke of some sort, and uh, nothing more is heard, and then you have the case of a witness who, who doesn't quite understand why there weren't many, many others who, who uh, came forth and reported the same thing. But just to, to pin that point down, there are cases when, where dozens of people have uh, uh, seen uh, objects uh, of unconventional sort, uh, and uh, uh, so that, that, that part of the problem does occur. Now, this, um, uh, this was uh, what kind of weather? Do you have, uh, uh, five years ago, do you have any mental recollection of the weather? Yes, it was a clear, sunny morning. I see. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was in the summertime. There was no... Uh, no haze of any description, mm-hmm. and uh, to me it was as uh, well as I said it was as clear as the nose on your face. Uh, there, there was absolutely uh, no haze of any description or fog or anything at all like that around the city, and I was adamant about it. This when I went into the Herald office and reported it, mm. and uh, uh, the chaps in there, well, you could see they had wry grins on their mm. face, as much as to say that you. Uh, you didn't know what you were talking about. You had a night out or something on the beer. Yeah, that's uh, that's <laughs> extremely unfortunate. That uh, is, is that's one of the many patterns that I find uh, uh, in my in my trip down here. That's essentially the same in Australia as in the States. A general uh, rejection of this by persons who, who usually have almost no knowledge of it, but who realize that it sounds at first glance like a lot of nonsense, and who jump to that conclusion. And when these people are in uh, in paper press or radio and so on, they tend to filter out a lot of the information that should be getting into scientific channels. We. Uh, we really can't uh, do an adequate job of checking this here, but I, I would uh, hope I can get.
get your phone in the course of, I don't know how this program quite operates, but I hope we do get a chance to uh, uh, give you a ring sometime during the day before I head down to Tasmania tonight. Uh, Peter, sorry, he's just given me a message to say, if you'd please not hang up uh, for a minute, uh, he'll take your he'll take your number. Okay, then. All right, just keep hanging on. Okay. Right, just for a moment. Now, what's your view about Jung's theory? Oh, I've uh, read the book, of course, uh, Barry, and uh, uh, talked it over with uh, quite a few psychologists back in the States. The main difficulty is Jung was not uh, at all addressing himself to what is the real UFO problem. Uh, he uh, is talking about psychotic types who have some kind of psychic needs to believe. And one does see uh, this sort of thing emerging in the cult and crackpot fringe, which is unfortunately very visible, uh, particularly in America, uh, centered around the UFO problem. People who feel that there's a salvation message uh, being brought from Venus and all that sort of rot. Uh, but this is not the UFO problem. This is just more of that old sort of thing. Uh, the uh, Jung was talking about this. If you re read the book carefully, you find him near the end of uh, that book uh, uh, taking the problem uh, seriously in terms of the possibility there may be something other than what he's talking about in the psychological art. But let me, let me just uh, wind up this point. Uh, the, uh, there are lots of cases where animals are present, dogs, horses, cows, and so on. Jung says these are psychic projections of archetypal images, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it uh, poses the puzzling uh, question, you see, Barry, that we have to make the assumption that uh, canine, equine, feline, bovine archetypal images are identical with ours. At least it seems to me to uh, pose that problem. If you think this is not a real uh, phenomenon, then why does it stamp feed cattle. Yes, but, but what, sort, what sort of reaction do you get from animals? They don't come oh. and they, they don't, don't delicately write out messages with their hoofs. Oh, uh, they don't write out messages, no. You don't, get, uh, you don't get a scientific paper out of a cow, but uh, it's an impressive message if we could talk about it. Yes, go on. Oh, just well, briefly. Uh, let me... T t uh, we were down with the Melbourne UFO group, uh, the Victorian Flying Saucer Society, uh, very helpfully have uh, been taking me around the countryside to some of the key witnesses. We were down in Moey, in the Gippsland area, talking to a farmer named Brew, uh, who was milking uh, 0700 on uh, February of 1963. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, coming out of uh, the overcast was a large disc-like object which hovered over a tree 100 yards away. I was on the spot a few days ago looking at it. Uh, the cattle, he was most impressed by the way in which the cattle uh, jumped and uh, stampeded, the uh, uh, dogs started barking, horses uh, uh, broke loose and so on. Uh, this is n not at all unrepresentative of the kind of panic reaction that animals show. I think Jung would, would have some time uh, explaining that. All right, we'll be back in just a minute with Professor McDonald. 638151, talk back. Uh, apropos of that uh, news flash, um, uh, Professor MacDonald, uh, about the United Nations, um, I was interested to hear your reference on the television interview you did last night about uh, Utant and uh, the UN attitude, or attitude of, of the Secretary General of UN anyway, about the unidentified flying objects. Could you recap for our audience? Yes, uh, that was uh, that's a very important point. Uh, on the 7th of uh, June, I was at the United Nations uh, speaking uh, to the Outer Space Affairs Group uh, about the UFO problem, uh, submitted uh, some formal statements to them, uh, urging UN uh, action uh, on the UFO problem. I had a date to see Utah, but the Middle East crisis interfered. Uh, subsequently, however, in uh, some kind of an exchange with Drew Pearson, is, is he oh, the American Australia? economist? And yes. Very uh, well. Utah made the statement now about uh, four or five days ago, I guess six days ago, that um, the UFO problem is uh, probably the most important international problem uh, with the present exception of the Vietnam War. Uh, rather interesting uh, and uh, somewhat striking statement. I cabled uh, Utant uh, uh, a reply uh, endorsing the statement uh, but uh, disagreeing to the extent of saying that in my opinion the UFO problem is is probably even uh, greater in international importance than the, uh, than the Vietnamese situation. Uh, but at any event, uh, let's hope that since it is apparently a global scale problem, and the Australian evidence uh, uh, added to the American evidence uh, and much uh, much other evidence uh, clearly attests to that, let's hope that uh, uh, UN scientific uh, uh, groups uh, will uh, get right onto it. Uh, incidentally, before any Freudians ring up, I, I should qualify what I said before about Carl Gustav Jung. He was, of course, the disciple of... Um, of, of Freud, but he's neither the first or the last disciple to break away somewhat from mm. the teachings of his master, which he did when he reached middle life. Right, uh, good morning. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, good morning. I thought that uh, Professor MacDonald might like to hear about a sighting made in New Zealand about ten years ago. Look, you, you might speak up a bit. There are some strange little green men on the telephone line, and, yeah. and, and yeah. power is coming out all the time. You'll have no, to speak no. up. Yes, I'm on a rather different connection at Mount Waverley. Yes. Uh, I'm a civil engineer, and ten years ago, I was employed by contractors building the first geothermal power station at Wairaki in New Zealand. Yes. One day I was surveying to set out the pipelines yes. in the uh, area of the thermal bores, and uh, there's a lot of noise in these bores. However, I had a, uh, a 
survey assistant at the time, Maori, who uh, was about 300 feet away. And I just finished setting up the Seattle light, ready to take a sighting. And uh, we both quite independently saw this grey object, uh, which for want of a better name I'll call a flying saucer, which uh, arose out of the steam bores away over on the horizon, went vertically upwards, it was uh, saucer shaped, it uh, traversed uh, sort of towards us and away from us, it rose in the east and uh, went towards the northwest at a very high speed, faster than any plane we knew of at the time. And uh, what made it more uh, convincing to us was the fact that there was broken cloud at the time and uh, we kept on seeing these things that would go behind clouds and reappear. And uh, as I say, we both saw it quite independently and uh, mutually drew each other's attention to it, even though we were out of earshot. Did you hear any sound or was it uh, at too great a distance by your estimate to hear a sound? Uh, well, as I say, I was in the area of these, uh, in the field of steam board, which uh, put out a terrific roar. And uh, I don't know whether you've been to Wairaki in New Zealand, no, but to but I make know. anyone else hear, you have to almost shout at their ear. I see. So there was no, no chance of hearing the sound. Uh, no chance uh, what of hearing. Do you, what do you estimate as the uh, distance to the object? Did you have any feeling for that as uh, an engineer? And, uh, you well, as I say, it arose on our horizon, and our horizon was a hill or ridge about... Uh, about a mile and a half away, and I'd estimate the clouds appearing at uh, at least 500 feet, so the height of the thing must have been more than 500 feet. Mm. It was only uh, a grey, dark grey, saucer-shaped object, and I couldn't uh, discern any other detail of it. I see. However, when we got back to uh, the construction site, we uh, sort of both talked to my fellow engineers about it, who immediately rubbished us. None of them had seen it? No, none of them had seen it. It was only the two of us. Uh, it was in uh, an area with no population, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other engineers, as I say, rubbished us and said, well, we shouldn't have stopped at the pub. Mm. And uh, the Maori chainmen, of course, didn't like to be uh, uh, made fun of in such a way, so he immediately disclaimed having seen it. I so, see. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereupon I uh, ceased to talk about it, and ever since then, I've only told people who uh, indicated some interest in the subject. You never reported that to the RAF or, or the New Zealand no, Air Force? No, at all. No, uh, no, I uh, have met quite a few people over the years who have uh, been interested in these things, and I've told them every detail I could remember. And uh, naturally, before I sighted this thing, I, uh, I was extremely skeptical of flying sources or UFOs myself. Yes. And uh, the result has been that since then, I, uh, I do believe most, although I'm still skeptical of some. Yes, well, I think that's a good way to be. Uh, I was skeptical, too, until I began to look at the uh, almost incredibly large volumes of uh, good reports. I hope I might have a chance to chat with you over the phone a little later uh, to get uh, many more details than we can do here. Uh, are you on the phone? I yes, mean, have you yes, your I own phone? Phone. phone? Hello? Yes. H have you your own phone? Yes, I have my own phone. I won wonder if you could just hang on for a minute when we... Uh, don't hang up for a moment. Peter Sari will take your telephone number from you. OK. All right? Good. Th thanks very much. You know, I, th I think that's a convenient uh, opportunity for me to, to ask you. We haven't got a great deal of time, but what is the official attitude, say, of the United States Air Force? Now, if any organisation has facilities, one would imagine, for examining what's going on in the atmosphere or... Uh, they ought to be able to have it. Now, what is their official attitude, and how have they handled the problem? Well, I've spent a great deal of time uh, uh, getting at the answer to your question. The uh, uh, official position is that it's a lot of nonsense, a uh, burdensome uh, duty that the Air Force is unable to get away with. Uh, the uh, uh, suggestion that the Air Force has a lot of competence to look at these problems is correct. Uh, there is expertise at the disposal of the American Air Force, but when you go digging, as I have, you find it just isn't being used and hasn't been used for 15 years. Project Blue Book consists of of uh, three people at present. The American Air Force Investigatory Program is a, is a major, a sergeant, and a secretary. This is quite surprising, you see, yeah. to have it so small. So, no, I'm afraid it has uh, just not been investigated at all in 15 years. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, go um, ahead. I just want to um, verify the fact of flying sources. I have seen two. Uh, they were rendezvousing. Um, Where? Uh, well, I was on a, a train, actually, that went from Christchurch over to the west coast of New Zealand. Yes. To the, um, I was going to see the Fox Glacier, actually, 
And the day was the 17th of the 11th, 55. Yes. Um, I, I'm reading from my diary now. I saw two objects spinning in the sky. They were white in colour and disappeared after a while. I was going to call the other passengers in the train to see them, but um, we went through one of the many tunnels at this time and they disappeared when we came out the other side of the tunnel, they were gone. What uh, what shape of objects are you describing here? Oh, well, they seemed to be semicircular. you know, they were just, um, you couldn't really make out a shape, they just seemed to be spinning at such a terrific speed. Did you have the impression they were many miles away or quite close? Could you... Oh, quickly? you know, not terribly far, you know, because uh, I could see them quite clearly. So not, not a very scientific... Uh, no, no, not at all, not because the train far. was moving, well, I mean, of course. They were five yeah. miles away or 300 yards away or... Oh, in terms well, of miles know, I didn't make a note of it, but I could see them that they weren't anything like I've ever seen before. There mm. wasn't a plane or um, helicopter or anything that I've ever seen before or since, really, because I haven't seen any in Australia. Mm. Uh, that date is uh, interestingly close to the date of a uh, sighting in New Zealand that I checked when I was over in Auckland, a oh, airlines pilot. I was just wondering, you know, if I could get in touch with the society over there. Yes. Because I might uh, substantiate if, if you, someone else's sighting. The flying the flying it is in my diary. It's written on the day. If you get in touch with the society here at Box 43, Box uh, 43. that's the Flying Saucer Society at Box 43, mm -hmm. Moorabbin, Yes. Victorian Flying Saucer Society. That's right. They'll be able to get you in touch with the New, New Zealand one. Oh, that's very interesting mm. because, you know, someone else on the train too could have seen it because, you know, I was only in one compartment of that particular train. Yeah. All yes. right. Well, look, we'll have to, we'll just see if we can take one very more, one very quick one. Yes. All right. Thank you very then. much for the Bye-bye. Oh, would you hang on and give your number to, uh, too late? He cried. Well, ring back and tell Peter Surrey later what your telephone number is, if you're still listening. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Hello. It'll have to be brisk, I'm afraid. Yes. Go ahead. Hello. Yes. Um, I was um, sitting at the front of my place in East Preston. Yes. On the uh, 8th of March, 1965. And my daughter was with me, married daughter. And she turned around and she said, Oh, there's, um, there's something moving across the sky there. And it looked like a star, but it was moving and all the other stars were standing still. So I went in and got the binoculars and looked at it, and it was a, a metallic blue object, iridescent blue, and it was like a, um, like a spinning top, only the flat type of spinning top. And it was moving in the sky, in the eastern sky, from the south to the north. Mm -hmm. Was this moving in, in a very rapid speed, or what uh, nature of, of motion involved here? Uh, well, fairly rapid. I didn't have time, I just had time to go and get the binoculars and then pick it up, and it just from view. Do you think it could have been a meteor? That's Well, I wouldn't know. Mm, you, you, when you looked at it, binoculars, uh, did it uh, exhibit actual shape and structure? Yes, it was like made out of a metal, an iridescent blue colour. Uh, what time shaped... of day... Yes, what time of day was this? I guess I didn't... It, it was about eight o'clock or half past eight at night. Was it dark or twilight? Let's... It was a lovely starry night. It was a summer night. Mm, I see. So you... Uh... Uh -huh. Well, that's uh, that's uh, moderately interesting. It might be well to talk with you a little bit further if we could. I, I wonder if you could just hang on and give you uh, give your telephone number to Peter Surrey. Yes, I'll All do right, that. just do that. I'm uh, afraid at this point we'll have to bring this uh, uh, colloquy to a to an end. Uh, I, I've enjoyed it very much, and I think it may have uh, uh, stimulated a very large number of our, our listening audience. Uh, Professor McDonald, when do you return to the United States? Well, I'm going back on the tenth after getting down to Tasmania and then up to uh, northern part of the country. Well, I, I, I don't know. It's well, I doubt if we'll have time to get you uh, back on the program again, we'd, but we'd very much like to. It was wonderful having you. Thanks very much well, for thanks. being on the program. Yes. We'll be back tomorrow morning. At